how do you optimize your brain to kick more ass? Or is it ass? It's the Australian pronunciation or the accent which makes ass and ass seem a little weird, doesn't it? <laughs> but how do you optimize your brain, brain health? How do you improve your cognitive function? We're going to figure it out today. And to help us do that, I've brought in Max Lugavere, who's joining me now from New York. How are you doing, Max? I'm doing great. How are you, James? I'm doing terrific. Thank you very much. And Max is somewhat of an expert on cognitive function. Uh, he uh, works for uh, Yahoo Health. He's a, a guy who, who actually interviewed me at the uh, Bulletproof Conference in Pasadena in uh, October. Um, and uh, he interviewed me about the 30 Day No Alcohol Challenge, which you've heard me talk about here on the podcast and on the YouTube channel. Uh, and now I'm returning the favor because Max is a very knowledgeable guy on all areas of health, as you would hope that an editor of Yahoo Health would be. Uh, <laughs> Max, it's great to have you here, mate. And um, wh where are you joining us from right now? I'm coming to you live from New York City. Um, I just got back actually yesterday. Last night I was in Naples, Florida. And it, lately my home has been uh, a thin metal tube hurling 30,000 <laughs> feet above the ground. Um, but no, but home base for me is primarily in New York City. But you're a Miami boy, are you? You're from Florida originally? No, no, no. I, I've spent time there. I went to University of Miami. So I've spent a good amount of time in Miami. Okay. Uh, and I lived in LA for 10 years also, which is where I know you are. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And now, and you're, you've been working on a documentary, um, which you were telling me about called Breadhead, which I assume is about the, the dangers of bread. Uh, <laughs> is that right? And how it affects our health? Well, it is about, so it uses bread as a metaphor for a highly processed food masquerading as a health staple. Um, I, you know, when I grew up and certainly, you know, up until just a few years ago, I used to consider whole grain bread uh, something that you wanted to eat a lot of in order to be healthy. And, you know, I've always been a very health conscious person, so um, I would eat a lot of it. And uh, what I realized is that your average slice of whole grain bread has a higher glycemic index than table sugar. It's America's number one source of dietary sodium. It's highly processed and refined. It contains gluten, which affects the way our guts function. And so all these sort of insights, you know, it started, they started to accumulate and coalesce. And then it dawned on me, uh, that it's really not something that you need to eat necessarily. And so I don't single out bread as being the one instigator of brain disease or anything like that. But I think that it's important to be mindful of the choices that we make as they pertain to our brain health. And bread is one of those things that if you're really seeking optimal health, it's the easiest sort of mix. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I, when I got onto the paleo lifestyle, if you like, the paleo style of eating about five years ago, back in 2010, I was shocked when uh, my paleo mentor, if you like, a guy called Chris Ashenden, who's called Chris the Kiwi, um, told me, cut bread out of your diet, mate. He literally said, cut bread out of your diet, mate, <laughs> just like that. And I was like, are you kidding me? What are you talking about? And he started telling me much of, you know, similar to what you just told me. And I did. I was hosting Sports Center on ESPN at the time, and I cut it out, and I also cut out uh, – white rice, potatoes, and soda. And in seven days, I lost like 10 pounds. It was out wow. of control. And my mother, who was watching me on the TV on ESPN at the time, actually phoned me and said, James, what's wrong with you? I'm like, what do you mean? She goes, you've lost so much weight in the last week. You look so gaunt in the face. I'm like, damn, there must be something to this. Like, you know, cutting out bread um, and, and, you know, amongst other things, seemingly has a huge effect effect on your body. And today we're going to be talking about how it affects your brain health. Um, and, uh, you know, Max, of course, you've been on the Dr. Oz show a few times and, you know, you've got a video vlog and, and, you know, this is a huge thing for you. And why is brain health so personal for you just before we get into how the viewer and the listener can improve their brain functionality? Why is this a passion of yours? That's a, that's a really good question. Um, so three, four years ago, um, I have a family member, my mother, who started showing signs of cognitive decline. And uh, this was in the absence of any prior family history, to my knowledge, um, of things like, you know, dementia. And, uh, and it was, you know, it was traumatic as it would be for anybody. Um, but again, as somebody who's always been really health conscious, uh, and has really had a, 
you know, penchant for reading science and understanding research, um, as soon as the initial, you know, trauma subsided, I really started to dig in and I had the luxury of being able to do that, I guess, because of just my, my work, um, into the, into the, into the research. And, you know, what I, what I learned and at the time I focused on Alzheimer's disease because Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia. It's not that my mom had Alzheimer's disease, but um, it's, you know, the fact that it's the most common disorder means that there's going to be a whole lot of research surrounding it. And what I learned at the time was that regardless of the neurodegenerative disease that you're talking about, there's all these overlapping similarities. And, um, and so I just, I focused on Alzheimer's and I sort of became a bit, I guess, of an expert in that, but really my research, uh, is, is, you know, encompasses other diseases too, Parkinson's, you know, I mm -hmm. did a vlog recently on Lewy body dementia because it was revealed that uh, Robin Williams had it and that, you know, got picked up and got a ton of views. Um, so I, so I became obsessed with this diet lifestyle brain health interaction because of my mom and because of, you know, my relentless quest to find anything that I could do or give her or, you know, have her avoid that might improve her symptoms. Um, but then also, on the other hand, it's not just about my mom, it's about me. It's about trying to find a way now that I know that I have this family history, all of a sudden from out of nowhere, to optimize my own my own cognitive health. I learned that changes for these kinds of diseases that we're talking about, for which there really are no meaningful treatments, begin in the brain decades before the first symptom, 30, 40 years before the first symptom. And you know, if you subtract 30 from my mom's age, you get me. And, uh, and this is a, a, a problem that is really reaching epidemic proportions in Western society. I mean, you know, so uh, one of the things that will become very clear if you watch uh, or listen to any of my talks or read any of my articles is that I'm, I'm very interested in this connection between metabolism and the brain. So the link between, for example, insulin resistance and the brain. Um, and, uh, you know, the recent... Estimates, the, most, the latest estimates uh, suggest that 50% of U.S. adults are either diabetic or pre-diabetic. And being crazy. diabetic, yeah, exactly. Being diabetic, global. I just, act, I, just to interrupt you for a second, I had a friend of mine tell me, she came over to my house a couple of nights ago and told me that she's been told, told that she's pre-diabetic or she's in, I'm not sure if that's a phrase, pre-diabetic, but she's in the, the early, she's showing signs of, of having diabetes or she's got like a very low form of diabetes. I'm not sure the, the, the exact terminology, but she was tremendously upset. And so she should have been because she's, she's overweight, like, and has been for, for some time. It's a mental issue with her. Like she has a, a mental association with food and eating for comfort and things like that. But I mean, I, I guess I was shocked, but at the same time, you telling me that half of the U S population yeah. Is either diabetic or heading towards diabetes is insanity to me. Yeah, those are those are the, you know, latest estimates and I mean it's it's hard to believe uh a statistic like that living in Los Angeles because you look around and everybody's, you know, thin and beautiful and in New York, you know, it's but like I travel a lot and you know, I get off the plane at any, you know, airport in the US and you just see that people are people are fat and it's and 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 I don't blame them necessarily. There's a there's a there's an educational issue here that that needs to be addressed. There's an access issue for sure. But you know, I think about that in the context of all the brain research that I'm doing. And, and being diabetic doubles your risk for Alzheimer's disease. You know, yeah. There was a study done by Suzanne Kraft down at Wake Forest University where insulin resistance insulin resistance is the hallmark of type two diabetes. So when I say that somebody is diabetic, it means that their body their cells have become deaf to the hormone insulin, which feeds their cells essentially. Mm. And they found that insulin resistance in the periphery, meaning in the body, is a good predictor for this amyloid plaque buildup in the brain that characterizes Alzheimer's disease and is also present in Parkinson's disease. So essentially what they're doing is they're accelerating, you know, by being diabetic or even pre-diabetic, certainly pre-diabetic, of course, you know, because this, this insulin resistance is really a continuum. Um, they're accelerating this, this aggregation of this plaque in their brain. That's the hallmark of Alzheimer's disease. I mean, it's like really terrifying and sad and horrible. And I'm, you know, that's, that's kind of the basis for what I'm preaching. Let me, let, me, let me break it down very simply. What it means is this. What it means is this. The fatter you get, the dumber you get. Yeah, yeah. In fact, there's an in, a perfect inverse correlation between the size of your waist and your total brain volume. 
And when it comes to the brain, size matters. So I mean, I, I saw I saw you being interviewed uh, on a on a show once, and you were saying that they were showing there's a part of the human brain that gets smarter or is activated with the more exercise that you do. Yeah. And yeah. So, and so people who exercise more uh, are not only happier and not only less stressed, but they're also smarter because it activates. Which part of the brain is it? Is it the the uh, amygdala? Is it the amygdala? Is that what it's called? Well, the hippocampus. So the hippocampus. exercise. Okay. Well, the well, I mean, exercise, as you just said, you know, has a has a broad range of effects on the body. It's mm-hmm. it's literally, exer- uh, exercise is medicine. Mm-hmm. A lot of people say food is medicine. Food is medicine, but so is exercise. Mm-hmm. And you know, exercise is one of those things that has been proven to grow new neurons in the hippocampus, which is the memory center of the brain. It's the first structure to be damaged in Alzheimer's disease. You know, it's really the, the hub of, of everything that makes us us, you know. Mm-hmm. Exercise has been shown to grow new neurons in that part of the brain. Yes. You could be 80 years old and do exercise and, and doing, you know, and that, that helps, you know, bolster the volume of that, of that very sort of vulnerable part of the brain in a way that there's not a single pharmaceutical drug on the market uh, can do. Exercise is better for your brain than any currently known pharmaceutical drug. And you're not going to see ads for exercise, you know, on the local news, um, unfortunately, but it's really, it's really potent. There's a new Ted talk that came out recently. Um, and, uh, and she, uh, this woman, uh, I think her name is Sandrine something or other. I'm just going to Google it right here now so I can get this correct. And she's saying that they've proven now here it is Sandrine Thure, or it might be Tourette. You can grow new brain cells. Uh, here's how. And she's a neuroscientist called Sandrine Thure. And she says that we can uh, improve our mood, increase our memory formation, and prevent the decline associated with aging all along the way. Uh, and one of the ways that she uh, says you can do that is through exercise and, and good nutrition. So you can take someone who's depressed, who's been on drugs, who's been given medication. To, to help them with their depression for many years. And through a combination of uh, good exercise, good nutrition, some mental exercises, if you like, you can literally create new, new uh, neurons in your brain to come out of your seemingly depressed state and into a much more positive state. Um, and I think that, I think she also said, I don't want to, I don't want to say this as fact because I, I'd want to go back and look at the Ted talk again, but I think she was also suggesting that the neurons that we have in our early adulthood are completely gone and have been replaced some years later, like 20 years later. So if you were, if you had depressed neurons back when you were in adolescence or, or early adulthood, if you could train your train your brain over the course of years in 40 when by the age of 40 or 50 you you might have you know seemingly very happy neurons and you're <laughs> like the complete opposite of that it's not so like oh you're born with this it's a chemical imbalance now trust me i've had this argument with people before and i'm no neuroscientist i'm no medical expert i just am a disseminator of what the experts say but um it's Pretty fascinating science, Max. And as we talk about brain health here, it's really exciting, isn't it? Because you, someone might be listening or watching right now and thinking, well, I'm just depressed. I've been told all my life that I'm depressed and I've been on medication all my life. Well, actually, the, the latest science is showing that you can get out of that without drugs with, by just simply good nutrition, good exercise. Is that your understanding as well, Max? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I think that a lot of people feel, you know, helpless when they're in the thick of depression. And, you know, there are peaks and valleys to the human experience. You know, certainly um, there's a term for it that I've learned recently called emo diversity. You know, like certainly we need we need to have a bit of variation in our mood, you know, because without feeling a bit bored sometimes, I mean, feeling really elated loses its its sheen, I guess, you know. So so there's a little bit of that day to day. But but actual clinical depression, I mean, it's been linked very recently uh, by numerous studies to inflammation. And inflammation is something that, you know, as, as you're well aware, you can easily modulate with your choices in life through exercise, through, you know, the diet, and things like that. Um, so you can actually, like, make choices to muscle your way through this depression. Um, 
you know, and if it's very severe, obviously you should, you should see somebody, you know, I don't want to supplant the role of, right. of a psychiatrist for, you know, for yeah. sure. But, um, but it is incredibly undervalued the role that, that diet and lifestyle have, uh, in our mood. And, and I think that that should be the, f- the, the first line, um, that people really sort of explore when trying to overcome problems with their mood. They should go out and exercise more because exercise can reduce inflammation in the body. They should go and look at, you know, their, their gut health. I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy to conceive of, of your stomach, you know, playing a role in your mood, but I say this all the time, your gut controls the dial on inflammation in your body. And now having all this research coming out that really, you know, uh, links depression with inflammation and the fact that we can keep our fingers on that dial of inflammation by, by nurturing the health of our gut. I mean, that's massive. Can you take a pro is our probiotics, the new Prozac? I mean, they might be for some people. I mean, I, I, ever since I realized that sauerkraut was a huge form of probiotics, I've been just smashing sauerkraut. I mean, and I'll tell you something interesting. I was in, uh, I was in, uh, was it stock? Yeah, I was in Stockholm, Sweden in September and, uh, I developed, started to, to, to develop a cold, right? I had a cold coming on. I started to sniff. I'm like, Oh no, I've come over here for, to celebrate my 40th birthday. And now I'm going to be sick. This is a nightmare. And I had remembered that my friend Mark Dahmer, who's a Hollywood personal trainer here and, and health expert, had told me that, you know, like that um, uh, sauerkraut was a huge form of probiotics, which can really help you get over sickness or, or reduce the amount of time. So I, I walked around Stockholm City Center for about an hour trying to find a, a um, supermarket that sold sauerkraut. And finally, mm-hmm. I found it. I don't can't remember what it was called. It was called something else in Swedish. But, so it was a little bit difficult trying to find it. But I found it. I went back to my hotel and I ate the whole tub over an hour. Now, it wasn't a particularly pleasant experience because sauerkraut is nice as, a, as an addition to a meal, not to eat as a meal itself. Um, but I forced myself to do it. And I, this was probably about... Uh, maybe just after lunchtime. Um, anyway, I had the cold for the rest of the day and the night. I went to sleep. I woke up the next morning, gone, completely gone. Now, I can't say with absolute authority that it was the sauerkraut. Maybe I just had a 24-hour cold. But I like to think it was. I like to think that I put in a whole bunch of probiotics, probiotics which fought off that cold. And as it worked, you know, over the course of almost, you know, 24 hours, let's say 18 hours, it, it fought off the cold. It killed all the bad bacteria by putting in the good ac- bacteria and I felt better. So that's my story. <laughs> anyway, yeah. I'm sticking to it with probiotics. I don't know if you've had a similar experience for that, Max. But... Well, I certainly, I certainly, you know, when I, you know, I've, I've definitely upregulated my consumption of probiotics and, uh, and, you know, I definitely feel good. Like my mood is, is very good. And I've in the past, you know, had, had dips, mm. um, but I think uh, this is really a paradigm shift in the way we think about these sorts of products. I mean, if you turn on the evening news, you know, you're bound to see an ad for, uh, for a probiotic supplement that, you know, really exploits the idea that they really are something to facilitate digestion and to ease mm-hmm. symptoms of, of GI distress and things like that. But what a paradigm shift in, in, in this idea that probiotics can actually you know, have an immunomodulatory effect. They can boost our immune system. Mm -hmm. They can affect our mood. So this is not just about digestion. I mean, this is about like way broader reaching um, physiological things that we're talking about, which I think is just so cool. We're talking to Max Lugavere. Did I pronounce it right? Yeah, good job. Okay, Max Lugavere, uh, Yahoo Health uh, editor and uh, the creator. Contributor contributor and the uh, up, uh, creator of the upcoming documentary, Breadhead. Uh, and today we're talking about improving your cognitive function, how to optimize your brain to kick more ass. So I'm about to turn on Periscope. Uh, if you're listening or watching um, and you're not following me on Periscope, please do download the app Periscope and follow me at James Swanick. And uh, you'll be able to uh, watch me live and ask me questions live. I'm about to turn it on now. Here we go. I'm a, I've called it... Uh, Ask us anything on health as I interview Max Lugaver from Yahoo Health about uh, brain health. There we go. So I'm going to start the broadcast now. And so we'll answer a few questions from some people um, as they, they bring in the questions. I'm going to take my head Sweet. Phone, awesome. friends off here so people can hear us or hear you rather. Um, okay. So let me just put this here. There we go. 
So Max, let's do a few little tips here as we wait for some uh, Periscope followers to come in and ask us some questions. Um, just give us a few tips on how we can improve our brain health, how we can kick ass with our brain. Give us like three or four tips that you've got, what you've, you know to work um, and what the listener or viewer can implement into his or her life. Definitely. Uh, so one thing that you can do is eat more green leafy vegetables. So vegetables are a brain health superfood, particularly dark leafy greens, which are replete with magnesium. Uh, magnesium is a brain health superstar. Um, in fact, magnesium has recently been correlated with, it's an interesting link. Magnesium was, was correlated even more so than protein with leg strength and leg strength was found to be a good predictor for brain volume, uh, and reduced brain aging, which is crazy. So, um, you know, magnesium has a number of, of important roles in the body. 60% of Americans don't eat enough of it. So I would say, uh, go for the dark leafy greens. They boost your brain and function in real time. Incredible. Um, I think a brain, an underrated uh, brain health superfood is also green tea. So this is number two. Green tea has been found in studies to boost working memory. It's also replete in a nootropic called theanine, which is said to boost feelings of relaxation without having a sedative effect. I actually use theanine um, when I'm sort of in the creative zone. Uh, I'm a songwriter. I've actually taken theanine and I've gotten some good songs out of that. Um, it's probably one of the reasons why green tea is the world's most popular beverage next to coffee. Um, so green tea is, is very valuable. Of course, there's caffeine. Um, I love it. Exercise. Uh, exercise would be number three. Exercise has a number of brain benefits. It increases insulin sensitivity. Insulin is the hormone that makes sure that all of your cells get fed from your toes up to your brain. Uh, it also floods your brain with feel good, um, hormones. Um, it's the, it's the one thing that you could do more so than any pharmaceutical on the planet to grow new brain cells, uh, which is, you know, really important, you know, where the brain is concerned, like I said, size matters. Um, they've taken adults and, uh, put them through mild to moderate exercise and they've found that it grew uh, the size of the hippocampus by 2%, whereas normally uh, when you age, yeah, you lose 1% to 2% of mass per year. With exercise, you can, you can potentially reverse uh, that decline in, in volume in the hippocampus. And, um, and also a study just you know, over the past two weeks uh, found that exercise boosted total brain volume as well, which is really interesting, um, especially in the outer layer of the brain. Okay. And just before you go on there, if you're watching this on Periscope Live now, uh, just let me know that you are here. I'm going to show you on the screen. We're, we're, we're on Periscope right now. Say hello to Max. And uh, make sure that you ask Max uh, some questions now. Max Lugavere, from, uh, who's a Yahoo Health contributor and a health expert and a documentary maker. So if you've got a question on brain health, uh, uh, please ask it now. In fact, here comes Sean MWT says, should you care about calorie restriction? That's an amazing question. And uh, the answer is yes, you should care about calorie restriction. Uh, calorie restriction is one of those things that has been shown uh, definitely in animals and it's been, it's been uh, suggested in humans to have life extending benefits. Um, it induces something called autophage, which is the body's sort of natural mechanism by which it cleans house in the cellular sense. Um, and you can sort of activate that by either restricting your calories or by intermittent fasting, which I'm a big fan of. Um, so that's, that's huge. That's a great question. I've been doing intermittent fasting this week. In fact, I've been following the protocol uh, called Kino body of a friend of mine called Gregor Gallagher. He's a Canadian uh, fellow. Um, and, uh, I, I met him, he came to my, he, he crashed my 40th birthday party actually <laughs> back in wow. September. Um, he's a friend, he was a friend of a friend. I never met him before. And uh, I didn't really talk to him that night because I was just talking to the people that I knew. But uh, uh, later on, I realized, you know, what he did and I reached out to him and he very uh, graciously gave me his time. Anyway, long story short, I've been on this keto body diet now for one week, which essentially is a I only eat in an eight hour window and I only eat two meals. So for example, I've been waking up at like 6.30 or seven and not eating until after one, one thirty. I have a meal and then I don't eat again until nighttime, 7.38, I eat a big meal. And then I actually have a packet of pop, uh, pop chips. You know those pop chips? He says, yeah. and, um, 
and which makes me feel like I'm eating crap, which makes me feel really happy because I like the feeling that I get from it. Um, but he says, yeah, go for it. Eat those things because it's all about, you know, number of calories essentially and also putting your body into that state where you're in a fasted state where it's burning. Anyway, cut a long story short, I've been doing it for seven days. I've lost exactly seven pounds. That's amazing. I mean, it's pretty amazing. My pants are starting to fall off around my around wow. my around my hip in just in just a week. Now I'm sure that that decrease in weight will start to slow down. It always goes very quickly initially as you're kind of like shocking the system. But it works like fasting. And here's the thing I am. I do. I do get hungry before that first meal, before I break my fast. So it's a little bit uncomfortable so far. But then when I eat the meal between that meal and dinner time, it's very easy. And then when I have my huge meal at night, I'm so satisfied. Like I'm like, oh, that's so good. I feel. I feel really good. I've also noticed an increase in energy. I haven't. My energy levels haven't gone down. If anything, they've gone up, even with the dis the slight discomfort of, of being in the fasted state. Hmm. Anyway, the idea is not just fat loss here. It's also muscle growth. I've been lifting heavier in the gym. The idea is that, you know, when you put yourself in an extended fasted state, it increases your growth hormone. So I'm hoping that that, you know, will make my muscles bigger, obviously, as I work out, work out in the gym. All right. Um, on Periscope, if you're joining us, I see Zeki8. Uh, 1834 just joined us. We're talking to Max Lugavere, a contributor to Yahoo Health and Health Expert. If you have a question, please type your question in right now. He is answering questions. And just as the questions come through, Max, maybe you could just tell us a few more tips on how we can increase our, our brain health. We've got eating leafy vegetables. We've got drinking green tea. We've got uh, exercise. Yeah. We had, uh, yeah. So what else have we got here? Green tea, exercise, yeah. Um, eating lots and lots of vegetables, eating healthy fat. Um, you know, I'm a huge fan of coconut oil. Uh, it's important to remember that, you know, we're humans, we like to cook and the most stable oils to cook with are saturated fats. Um, and we've been told for a long time not to eat those instead, you know, millions and millions and millions of people worldwide switched from cooking with saturated fats to cooking with polyunsaturated fats, which easily oxidize, very unhealthy for the brain. Um, but it turns out that, you know, that, that cooking with oils that are stable at high temperatures uh, actually confers a health benefit um, in that you're not consuming oxidized oils in the process. But aside from that, coconut oil is uh, very high in a kind of fat called a medium chain triglyceride, which um, provides ketones to the brain, which are a very clean burning fuel source to the brain. And uh, it's thought that they can actually provide not only a, clean, a cleaner burning fuel source to the brain, but an alternate fuel source uh, to brains that are sort of metabolically ailing, which is what they see actually in um, neurodegenerative disease. So coconut oil is actually, it's quite a medicinal food. It yeah, actually I, is use, a medicinal food. I use a lot of coconut oil. I'll tell you what, what other use I, I, I have for coconut oil. I use it as a moisturizer on my face. Wow. It's funny. I, 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 uh, and by the way, we just had another question here from, um, from Puka, I think it was, who says, I have hepatitis C what foods should I not eat? But just before we get to that, um, just back on coconut oil. Um, yeah, Ben Greenfield from Ben Greenfield Fitness. Um, actually, he's a good friend of mine. We're in an entrepreneurial group together. And, um, and uh, we, we, I actually, he actually interviewed me on his podcast about me not drinking, about the 30-day no alcohol challenge. And it had such a high response or you know, people were so interested in it that he actually did a 30-day test with one of his listeners who was a sort of like a guinea pig and a guinea pig. And they, they took his blood work um, before he stopped drinking for 30 days and then afterwards. And it was insane how his health improved so dramatically just from cutting alcohol out of his diet for 30 days. But anyway, Ben Greenfield told me, um, uh, don't put these, these mainstream moisturizers on your, on your face, like Neutrogena and like, um, you know, whatever all those big brands are because they're full of chemicals and full of parabens. And I had a look and he was right. I was like, Oh my God. And his rule was never put on your body what you wouldn't put in your mouth um, <laughs> I like because, that. because when you put it in your body, it's going in your bloodstream anyway. So unless you want to just like sit down and drink a bottle of moisturizer, why would you rub it on onto your skin? And so he said, use extra virgin olive oil or coconut oil and just dab it on your face and use that as a natural moisturizer. Big, uh, big mistake initially because I put too much coconut oil on my face and I went out to a party. I was in San Francisco in particular that night and people were all looking at me weird going, what's that shit on your face, mate? What the hell is that? I'm like, oh, I put too much on. So now you just have to put just a little dabble 
you stick it on and that's i'm good to go and now people like women especially are like oh you smell nice what's that i'm like yeah i got a bit of coconut oil on me <laughs> that's amazing man that's so funny and then I and, a, yeah go I, was, on. I, have a, I have a story a similar like embarrassing things that we do and we're health junkies like one of those stories uh-huh um, I have you. I don't know if you've ever done a niacin flush. Are you familiar with niacin? No, I know I haven't. No. So if you take a high dose of niacin, it uh, it's basically a really potent vasodilator. So it basically opens up all the capillaries in your body. Most of the 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 niacin that you get in multivitamins, it's usually niacinamide, which doesn't have this effect. But there's another form of niacin called nicotinic acid, uh-huh. and if you take it. You get, you get what's called the niacin flush. You go red. It just opens up all the capillaries in your body and you become like a lobster. It also makes your, your mucous membranes uh, start functioning and, and your nose starts running. It's really, uh, it could be unpleasant, but it's actually quite cleansing because all the oxygen is going to your skin. It's, very, it's sort of very cleansing. I, but anyway. so I think someone told me that niacin can stop stop you for alcohol you, you keep going and and yes. well, I'm, i think i've got nice and that i was given nice and on my 40th birthday party as something to stop people drinking i'm going to look for it for a second you keep talking yeah so niacin um you know it's prescribed for people with um high cholesterol it basically opens up all of the capillaries in your body um very noticeable uh it's a rush yeah so is that the flush free there you go. niacin i have it yeah beautiful so, so you want to you want to look and make sure that it's not the flush free version because only only I think it's nicotinic acid that that has that flushing effect. It so says it says niacin vitamin B three a hundred milligrams cardiovascular support promotes energy metabolism. Uh, and is it ni- ni- nicotinic acid or the is ingredient, ni- niacin? The ingredients are di- diesel or. Decalcium phosphate, microstalian cellulose, vegetable steric acid, vegetable cellulose, vegetable magnesium stearate, free of gluten, wheat, dairy, soy, yeast, sugar, sodium, artificial flavor. Uh, yeah. Does that answer your question or no? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's really great to take. Um, and there's like a 20-minute sort of window where nothing happens. And then all of a sudden, you, you just become – you feel the heat – Everywhere you become bright red and it becomes, it looks splotchy. It's really, you know, unpleasant if you're not aware of the. <laughs> Sounds wonderful. Let me, no wonder I haven't left it in my pantry and I haven't popped any of these pills yet. But it's good because think about all that, that increased blood flow. So oxygen, you know, blood, nutrients. I actually take it with a cocktail of other supplements. And so I hypothesize that by opening up all those capillaries and taking it with all these other supplements, you're basically. Uh, just the bioavailability is increasing. You're, you know, extending the the reach of where all these nutrients and things go. Um, but anyway, I um, so like your coconut oil story. I took it once and I forgot that I had taken it. And I had a meeting, a really important meeting. It was in LA. It was like with an agent or something like that. And uh, I go to the meeting, and then like ten minutes into the meeting, I start feeling the heat, and I'm like, you know, I start turning bright red. I just know my nose is going to start running. And I'm literally in this meeting, like trying to be serious and have a serious conversation with this agent who I'm trying to impress or something like that. And uh, it was one of the most embarrassing moments of my LA life where like I start, you know, undergoing this like niacin flush in 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 the midst of a meeting. And I had to explain that like I took niacin. I'm a bit of a health junkie. I do kind of, you know, a bit of a guinea pig. It was hilarious. But anyway, um, that, that uh, <laughs> yeah, I love, it. yeah, I look weird because I'm a human guinea pig. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Self, ex- self experimentation, you know? So just before we answer a couple of the questions that came, that came in, just to be clear on nice and the, the, the main point of that is what you take it for what, what's the sole purpose? It's a vitamin. So it's a, you, you need to take it and we get it from food sources okay. and you know, it's in, I don't take a multivitamin, but it's in, it's found in multivitamins and things like that. Um, it's okay. actually prescribed for people with high cholesterol. I don't have a, a cholesterol problem. Um, but one of the things that it does in the body is it acts as a vasodilator and it's very cleansing. Okay. I feel. So, so should I take it on in a fasted state and, and what, what would I expect if I'm like, if I take it right, right now in 20 minutes, what should I expect to happen on an empty? Uh, it's a ride. It's you're going to, you're going to start flushing all over your body. 
Um, you're going to feel really hot and warm. Okay. Um, and your nose is going to start running. Um, and that's going to last for about a half an hour. And then it goes away and you feel great afterwards. Okay. So you want to put yourself through pain in order to feel better <laughs> later. Is that, what, is that what it is? Yes. Okay. Yeah. It might have what's called a hormetic um, mechanism. You know, hormesis is this, is this term that I really love. It's a, it's a term that describes the benefit of mild stress. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it might put your body through just, just the right amount of, of stress that activates protective and reparative mechanisms. Okay. This is also one of the uh, mechanisms by which intermittent fasting is said to confer its benefits. Um, why sauna use is beneficial, why gotcha. calorie restriction is beneficial. Okay. This is, like, this is hormesis. And so I think that uh, there might be a little bit of that going on with niacin. But overall, the reason why I take it is because I think it feels really, it feels uncomfortable, but then it feels really good. And, and you feel, it feels like it's having a bio, like a bioactive effect that I think is, um, you know, I just, I, I enjoy it. Okay. So you don't have to take it. I'm not going to suggest everybody take it. And certainly, you know, if, if you, if you're not in good health, you might want to check with your doctor before doing that. But, um, but I, I enjoy it. Okay. I'll give it a shot. So we had a, let's answer. Um, the initial question was, uh, uh, he or she had, um, uh, hepatitis C, what foods uh, should they not take? Are you familiar enough with hepatitis C, Max? I'm not. I would think that you would be, though, given your interest in the liver and alcohol and things like that. But I'm not. And, you know, I should state that I'm not a doctor. I'm just, I'm very interested in, in this health stuff. But hepatitis C, I don't know anything about. We had a question to come in. They said, what's the proper dosage of niacin? It's come in here from uh, R-O-N-I-B on Periscope. I would start with 100 milligrams. Yeah, so that's just what one I, of those pills. Yeah, one of those. Yeah, pills. That, that's what I take. But there are again, there are two kinds of niacin. There's the flushing kind and the non-flushing kind. As you can imagine, most people uh, would be caught very off guard if they took a multivitamin and started flushing. So most of the niacin that's out there promises uh, to confer no flush. But what I'm saying is that you actually want the flush, and I okay. think it's nicotinic acid that has that effect. So okay. you just, I think it's very, it's as easy as looking on the label. I actually have a bottle in my room. I've got a question here from Sean MWT who says, what's your daily supplement cocktail? Great question. I take a very um, potent fish oil supplement and I usually pop about three of those per day. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, fish oil is replete in omega-3 fatty acids, DHA, EPA. Um, so I take a, a high quality fish oil supplement every day. Um, I also supplement with 5,000 IUs of vitamin D3. Mm -hmm. um, I don't uh, always get to spend time in the sun. So on days that I'm not in the sun, I take 5,000 IUs of vitamin D3, which I omit from my cocktail if I'm, say, traveling and I'm in the sun a lot, I'm on vacation, whatever. I don't take the supplement. Mm -hmm. I also take a uh, vitamin B complex. Um, you know, I... Uh, I Vitamin B has been found, uh, you know, when you take it in the, in the complex form to reduce levels of homocysteine in the body mm -hmm. um, and prevent brain atrophy and improve brain function. Um, and so this is very important. I take that. Uh, and then that's about it. I do supplement sometimes, I would say most, most times with astaxanthin, which is a carotenoid, um, very potent free radical scavenger, very potent antioxidant, anti-inflammatory. It's uh, found usually in krill, krill oil. So krill oil is another one of those supplements that, um, I think is probably quite beneficial, yeah. but I, I'm, I'm similar to you. I take fish oil and I take vitamin D, uh, on times when I'm not getting enough sun. So I'll, mm -hmm. I have vitamin D and fish oil in my pantry uh, at all times. Yeah. Um, I also now, obviously now that I've created these blue blocking glasses, this is not a supplement obviously, but um, I wear these blue blocking glasses called Swannies uh, by Swanick. It's the new. Those are awesome. Out. And uh, what these do is they block the dangerous uh, blue light that that are, that are emitted from our cell phones, from laptops, um, from uh, TV screens uh, at nighttime. Um, and so I'll put them on an hour and a half, couple of hours before I go to sleep. Um, and what it does is it starts quieting down the brain. It starts blocking that blue light the body starts to naturally think, oh, look, it's, not, it's nighttime. Because when we're in this, all of this artificial light, the body still thinks it's daytime. 
So when you put these on, your body can then go, oh, okay, the circadian rhythm, your internal body clock is starting to go, all right, it's nighttime, start to create uh, time to start creating melatonin now. So then if, uh, eventually when you, when you turn the light off and you take these things off, you can then fall asleep faster and go into a deeper sleep because your body's had that hour and a half or two hours to prepare for, for its natural sleep cycle. Um, so I think it's brilliant. I, yeah, that's, that's amazing. Remember Have that you, song, I Wear My Sunglasses at Night? Who oh, that that let was? me tell you, Mac, <laughs> you've just set me up. That is, I love that because in the, oh, I love this song. There was, a, there was a compilation album that came out in 1985 in Australia called Choose 1985. And it was a pink cover and it had um, Agadu on it. It had Tina Turner, What's Love Got to Do With It. It had Ghostbusters on it. It was one of the first tapes I ever got, right? I was 10 years old. And one of the songs was... And then it builds up to the chorus like... I wear my sunglasses at night so I can, so I can. It was the greatest song ever. So yeah. And he had the right idea. You know, I mean, this was decades before the, we knew about, you know, how blue light affects the, the, the brain particularly. I mean, this was way even before smartphones, you know. I'm sure we knew about blue light back then, but it, this is before the epidemic of, of nighttime blue light, thanks to our, you know, technology that we have today. Um, but what a, what a great song that is. And, and, you know, in retrospect, thinking about just how, how profound an impact blocking blue light can be by wearing, you know, sunglasses like yours. Maybe I should make that part of the marketing. Like I wear my sunglasses at night the, 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 and like just make a little joke about it and play it as a tune or something like that just to try and hit home. It would be app. silly not to. It would be silly not to. <laughs> I think yeah. so. And if you're listening and watching, you don't know what we're, we're talking about because maybe it's a little bit before your time. Just go onto YouTube and type in, I wear my sunglasses at night and watch the 1985 video. It's hilarious. And it's such a great song. And it just brings, you look how excited I am talking about it because it just brings back these childhood memories, you know, of listening to the Choose 1985 compilation tape. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is, what I love about the, you know, about your sunglasses, for example, is that like I would totally wear them at night and then people would probably think that I was a douche for wearing sunglasses at night. But I'd be like, no, this is like why you should be wearing, you know, you need to be blocking blue light at night. You're disrupting your melatonin production. Melatonin controls the expression of hundreds of genes, blah, blah, blah. So I think it's a really good way to actually make an impact on people. It gives you an opp the opportunity to talk about why you're wearing the glasses and to, to actually help people. Thank you. Yeah. Well, we're trying to actually get away from calling them sunglasses that you wear at night, even though that song would be a good fit because what they essentially are are night glasses. And I'll, I'll just to give you a little bit of context, um, you can, you can get blue blocking glasses. You can buy them, right? But they are as ugly as sin. I mean, they're terrible. They're like these big kind of like safety goggles that you see workmen uh, using when they're, they're mowing lawns or they're doing construction and to protect themselves from flying stones and debris, right? So you can actually wear those and they're pretty effective. Um, you, you know, I, I had a pair here that I used for several months, but I could never go out and dine with friends at a restaurant. I could never go out in a social situation and wear these things because people are like, why are you wearing your sunglasses at night and why are you wearing those but ugly safety goggles. So I was like, how can I actually wear blue blocking glasses at nighttime and, and it be socially acceptable? It was actually playing more on my vanity than it was really on the health, uh, health benefits, Max. I was like, how the hell can I look cool in a social setting with girls around and, you know, my mates and everything. And so, uh, you know, I've spent a good 10 months, almost a year now, playing around with putting um, these orange frames in uh, these orange lenses rather into some stylish frames. And this is the pair that I, that I've come up with. I'll put it up on the video. If you're listening on the audio, I'm just showing uh, Max now on the yeah. video, the brand there they're called Swannies, uh, S W A N N I E S by Swanwick. In fact, if you want to just check out a little bit more about this, you can go to swanwicksleep.com swanwicksleep.com uh, and they're available on Amazon now as well. You can, you can grab a pair on Amazon, but yeah. So now I've got this stylish pair so you can wear them and, and hardly anyone asked me about it. I mean, they, and if they ask me about it, they go, Oh, they're cool. Tell me about those. 
<laughs> rather than you look like a douche. What <laughs> the hell are you doing? And so now my sleep has improved dramatically ever since I started using blue blocking glasses at nighttime. I'll tell you when I started doing it. It was exactly a year ago and I was obsessed with watching Mad Men and I'd never watched the TV show Mad Men uh, up until like, you know, a year ago. And so my way of relaxing at the end of a night was to come home and sit in bed and watch Mad Men. And so for the first week I did this, I was just looking at my screen this blue light was coming out at me. I didn't have the protective glasses on. And then I would put the laptop down at the end of an episode and I'd struggle to get to sleep. And I'd wake up in the morning just kind of like, eh, that wasn't a great night's sleep. Right. And then a week later, my friend Mark told me about the power of you know blocking blue light. I put on these butt ugly safety goggles and I watched the next month of Mad Men wearing these goggles. And I was found myself falling asleep halfway through the damn episodes as compelling as the episodes were. And even when I did watch them, I closed the screen, I take off the glasses and then I would fall asleep almost, you know, almost right away. And then I'd wake up feeling much refreshed, yeah, much refreshed in the morning. Have you had any similar experiences to that Max? Or does that sound about right to you based on, you know, your understanding of, of blocking blue light? Well, I, so I use an app on my laptop called Flux, which yeah, I'm sure you're great. familiar with. Which Flux filters is amazing. Out the blue light. Yeah, Flux is amazing, which filters out the blue light from my laptop. But that doesn't exist for my iPhone, or at least it doesn't without me having to jailbreak my iPhone. Um, and I do use my smartphone a lot. I'm a you know, knowledge junkie. And so like it could be two in the morning and I'm out and something piques my curiosity. I'm, I'm on Google. So um so the blue light emitted from my smartphone is uh, a problem. And I do look at my smartphone up until the minute I go to bed, which I know I shouldn't. Um, but, uh, but yeah, anything that I could do to filter that out, you know, as you mentioned, TV is also a big problem. I have a pretty large TV. So, I mean, it's a lot of blue light at night. Um, and, you know, just to, just to uh, sort of highlight the potential brain benefits of, of filtering this blue light, aside from the melatonin production, um, being suboptimal, you know, as a result of, of this sort of epidemic of blue light, as you mentioned, um, sleep is when your brain cleans itself out of this plaque that I mentioned earlier in the, in the show um, that accumulates in Alzheimer's disease. So clearance is a major uh, protective mechanism against these diseases, again, which, you know, there are no meaningful treatments for them. Um, and so we really want to optimize our sleep because this is when this clearance process happens. It's also when we are consolidating our memories, uh, which is, you know, everything that we've encountered during the day, all the thoughts that we've had, all the things that we've attempted to learn, uh, those, those ideas are stored in our short term. And over the course of the night, they get sort of consolidated and stored, um, saved on the hard drive, so to speak, of the hippocampus. And this all happens during these phases of sleep, which we know are altered as a result of blue light um, use before bed. I mean, there was a study that um, I read actually because it was, it was posted on the blog of Flux where just the use of a, of a, of a tablet for 10 minutes before bed dramatically lessened the amount of time spent in REM sleep and it made it take longer for the, subject, the study participants to fall asleep. So, I mean, right there, it's affecting our sleep. Yeah, it's, it's sleep is also, you know, with that, with just, you know, a tiny, uh, deficit of sleep, you know, we become less insulin sensitive. So going back to the role of insulin in the body and just how important that is, I mean, sleep is just one of the most healing things. And, um, and I think that we have yet to really appreciate the damage that, uh, smartphone use is having on our sleep. I mean, we've only had smartphones for what, eight, 10 years. Yeah. Yeah, 2007, I think the the first iPhone came out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm shocked at how much I use my phone, even though I'm you know I'm quite health conscious and you know trying to be as anti technology as possible. I mean, this iPhone that I'm now look look at the power of it. Like like it's a spaceship. This thing. I mean, I'm 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 recording Periscope. I can record video from a 30 day no alcohol challenge. I can check my email. I can be up to date on my social media. I can. I've got, an ins I've got a whole library in my fingertips. I can book flights. I can do banking. I mean, everything that I need in life is in this damn, damn phone now, which is a great thing, right? It's an amazing tool, but it is coming at, at a high cost. And that is, is that that blue light is, key, is disrupting your sleep. And if you have disrupted sleep, your hormones are not um, functioning the way they're supposed to. You're keeping fat around your waist. You're tired and lethargic the next day. That 
that uh, being tired and being lethargic affects your mood. And when that affects your mood, it affects your relationships. And when your relationships are affected, it affects your ability to be productive. And when you're not productive, you don't make as much money. And when you don't make as much money, you become sadder and more depressed. And when you're sadder and more depressed, it affects your relationships. And it's just, it just they're all linked and all intertwined. A highly self-perpetuating vicious cycle that's, yeah, that literally can be uh, exacerbated by getting bad sleep. Yeah. All right. Well, Max, we should start to roll this off. I reckon you and I could talk for about three hours on this, on this, yeah. on this, uh, this topic. Um, uh, but thank you so much. Let's just go over uh, when we were talking about, uh, we were talking about brain health, obviously, uh, sorry. Uh, um, yeah. Brain health and how to optimize your brain to kick more ass. So food wise, uh, Max was talking about eating leafy greens. You can drink green tea, make sure you get lots of exercise, eat lots of good coconut, uh, coconut oil, good fats like coconut oil. Um, also, uh, you know, grab yourself a pair of, of blue blocking glasses to block out the dangerous blue light, which is going to help your sleep. Even if you don't do that, just turn off your electronics an hour and a half before you go to sleep. That'll quieten down your brain. Try to get as much sunlight as you can during the day as well. That's also going to help with your circadian rhythm. Because when you, like, when you wake up in the morning, please go outside, let the skin senses feel the sunlight because that's basically telling your brain and your circadian rhythm that it's daytime that it's that it's the morning fast forward tonight then your brain or your body will will know it's time to go to sleep but if you're not getting sunlight in the morning or you're sitting or you're getting a little bit of sunlight and then you're sitting under fluorescent lights all day that's just slowly killing you. Your cortisol levels are going up. Your brain, your body doesn't isn't getting natural sunlight. That's affecting your sleep. That's affecting your brain later on at night. It's all all intertwined. Um, Max, uh, how do we follow you on social media? How do we check out your documentary? Just tell the listener and the viewer now where we can find more about you. Yeah, so we are um, we're in production on the documentary now, and we're still raising money. You can contribute whatever you want to breadheadmovie.com. Also, join the mailing list. Whatever you, whatever, however you choose to engage, I'm super grateful, and um, you know, and it all helps. Uh, I'm primarily I use Facebook um, the most frequently. Facebook.com/slash Max Lugavir. You can find me. Uh, I'm also on Twitter, Instagram. Um, and you can also subscribe to my YouTube channel where I post, uh, regular vlogs weekly. So I'm out there. I'm, you know, on all the social media channels. And if you're watching and listening right now and you've come this far, cause we've been talking <laughs> for about an hour, send a tweet right now to at Max Lugavere and at James Swanick. And just what, what was the number one takeaway from this interview, from this, this discussion? Max would love to hear from you. I'm sure he will retweet you. Make sure you follow him on social media and check out breadheadmovie.com. Uh, that sounds amazing. I, I can't wait to see that. Uh, thank you very much for those people on Periscope. Give Max lots of hearts right now. I'm going to just show you up on the video here. We've got some hearts coming for you. Max, you can see the hearts there. Yeah, lots of hearts. Lots of hearts. Robert yeah. SB27 just joined. We're just finishing, uh, Robert. Sorry about that, mate. But um, if you've got any final comments uh, that you want to give to uh, to Max, just uh, give us a shout out right now as we start to wrap this up. Uh, <laughs> we've got Tom C Z U K has just joined. We've got a few more people joining right at the end, Max. Oh man, parting is such sweet sorrow. But um, <laughs> I mean, but we could keep this conversation going for another two hours at least. I'm uh, sure for at least another two hours. On uh, my we part. didn't even get into alcohol, which I know you know. I'm, that's the whole other rabbit hole that we can go down. Yeah, we've got uh, R-O-N-I-B says, thanks, Max. Uh, so thank you. Thank you very much for your excellent questions. Uh, thank you so much to Sean for asking questions as well. So we'll wrap this up now. Uh, Max, great talking to you as always. Really appreciate, thanks, really appreciate that. You've been very informative today and look forward to catching up with you soon. And Same. Let's do it again. Absolutely. And to the viewer and the listener, make sure you follow me on Periscope. You can, if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, go to the James Swanick Show podcast in iTunes, download it, subscribe. I send out at least a couple episodes every week. Um, and uh, yeah, make sure you tweet us out now. Thanks so much. And I'll catch you on the next one.